praise the Lord. Amen. Yes, praise the Lord. <laughs> yes. I'm very sorry. I'm just coming from work. So I have to pack on the way and then join the Zoom. It's all good. You're here, so that's all that matters. <laughs> that's all right. That's, that's yeah. fine. That's Amen. fine. Amen. Amen. We have to okay. do a lot of that sometime. Yes. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. So greetings, everyone. Thank you so much for coming. Uh, so for this special program, Chosen, we're focusing on something special this year. This year, we're going to focus on the Holy Marriage Blessing. And the marriage blessing is purpose to rebuild families, restore communities. And while, while, we're, while we're restoring families and communities, we're going to renew the nation and the world. Amen. So um, this evening, we're having Reverend, Reverend Hernandez, who will gather our attention to the crisis that all families in America face today. The crisis in America can only be resolved through, through realizing God's hope for America. <laughs> which is essential for all beings. So let us call all brothers and sisters to encourage them to join us this evening for Chosen. Amen. So um, let us begin in prayer with Minister Michael Nkrumah, representative from uh, Philadelphia for ACLC and YCLC. Uh, Minister Nkrumah. Amen. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Let's bow our head as we pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for this evening. We give you all the glory. We give you all the honor. Father, as your children have gathered here today on this platform, we commit every activity into your hands in the name of Jesus. Father, we commit the topic that we are about to discuss into your hand that you, God, will pour down your Holy Spirit upon our heart. We commit our heart into your hand that you, God, will give us spiritual understanding. For everything that we are discussing, Father, open our heavenly mandate so that we will not take it carnally, but we will take it spiritually and it will go into our heart and written into our heart and it will be an evidence in our life, in our daily activity. We commit every member on this platform into your hand that you, God, will protect and guide them in the name of Jesus. We pray that you, God, will fill us with your Holy Spirit. We pray that you, God, will lead us with your wisdom, knowledge, and understanding. Everywhere that we are about to spoken, Father, let the Holy Spirit take control with our lips, take control with our heart, take control with our mind, and take control with our inner being. Father, we commit ourselves unto you that with the end of this meeting, let your name be glorified and virtue will be unto you forever and ever. We thank you, Lord Jesus. We give you all the glory. May your name be praised forever and ever. In Jesus' mighty name, we pray. Amen and adieu. Amen. Amen. Adieu. Wow. Wow. Amen and adieu. Amen. Thank you so much, Minister Nkrumah. Wow. Amen. Amen. Now we will hear a brief word on why we are hearing Christianity in crisis in relation to clergy blessing movement from Dr. Rouse, the American Clergy Leadership Conference National Co-Chairman, Dr. Rouse. Thank you and greetings Christian clergy friends and neighbors. Tonight I'd like to share a word with you from the Holy Scripture. But you are a chosen people a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. First Peter, the second chapter, the ninth verse. We are the people of God gathered here this evening to hear of the crisis that challenged citizens of the United States of America, which often casts darkness into our lives. Even on the brightest of days, things seem dark because of the crisis that continues in our lives. Dark clouds and storms threaten to ruin our marriages and our families, not from the stormy weather, but from the storms of abuse, 
unnecessary killing. Things that we will hear about that leaves our families, our marriages, our relationships with one another in despair. When we are presenting words on Christianity in crisis, so as to reveal the urgency of now as the time to rekindle Christianity throughout this chosen land in the way in which we are going to really get Christianity back, the reason why we want chosen and other activities to educate, to inform, is that we can see the significance of Father and Mother Moon having been chosen by God through Jesus Christ to bring the answer to the world. And we know the answer to be in the Holy marriage movement. And that's why we educate to seek to strengthen the marriages and families, bringing a new hope as we bring God back to the core of our existence in the majority of our homes, even striving to center all marriages in obedience to the will of God. Yes, to our coexistence, we need to be obedient to God. Listen, tonight you are going to have an opportunity to go deeper in your listening and understanding, but also to ask relevant questions and receive the answers during the weeks that Reverend Hernandez will be leading us through this very meaningful word of God that was given to the world nearly 50 years ago by Father Moon. When the Reverend Sung Young Moon spoke, he spoke out of a deep relationship with Jesus Christ with God. Some have even said to me they found no man on this earth at this time in the 20th and 21st century who was closer to Jesus Christ. So I hope and pray that everyone on this call will turn your ears to listen tonight for we are chosen. Not only that, we are determined to bring God back to our future through the Holy Marriage Blessing. Thank you, Minister Quinn. Thank you, Minister Holmes, for all of the work that you do. And thank you, Reverend Mark Hernandez. You're the greatest staff on earth, and I'm blessed to work with you. Marie and I appreciate you so much. And we are always indebted to Dr. Kihun Kemp, who enabled us to be in this position. Thank him, thank God, thank all who've supported that decision and continue to pray as we listen tonight. God bless you all. Amen, thank you, Dr. Rouse. Mm -hmm. Now um, let us proceed and um, go to the special presentation from Reverend Hernandez. Reverend Hernandez is the ACLC National Executive Director. And um, let us hear from Reverend Hernandez. Please, please start. You, are, you have to hear what you're going to share. Reverend Hernandez. Good evening, brothers and sisters. It is uh, indeed an incredible honor to be um, your presenter tonight. I'm going to begin sharing my screen. And tonight, I'll be presenting a portion of uh, the speech entitled Christianity in Crisis. Um, I can make this fill up the whole screen, but it'll make the picture smaller. I wanted you to be able to see this. I don't know if you all can see it. Um, this picture taken on the steps there in, at Wall Street. This is a rally happening uh, maybe a week or two before October 1st in 1973. 
It was covered by the New York Times. It says, rally begins beneath the statue of George Washington at Federal Hall Memorial. Wall Street hears 400 pray. I just read this first part here. More than 400 young Christians from this country and 21 foreign lands sing hymns and prayed for two hours on the steps of the Federal Hall Memorial yesterday, urging hundreds of skeptical Wall Street workers who looked on to, aban who looked on to abandon mammon for God. And then I want to turn your attention to the New York Times advertisement, Christianity in Crisis. I will go to full present here. This is a full one-page advertisement in the New York Times announcing the Christianity in Crisis tour in which uh, Father Moon would give a three-night crusade speaking on God's hope for man God's hope for America, and the future of Christianity. Each one of those speeches, an incredible speech. Again, this is 1973. I want to bring up that year because actually he arrived in the United States to carry on this ministry in December, uh, the second half of December in 1971. And by October of 1973, his young volunteers, those 400 young Christians you saw on the steps of the, uh, at the corner of Wall Street, they invited a packed house every night to Carnegie Hall. And underneath here at the bottom, it's showing the other cities in the 21 cities that he's going to go to uh, and then return back to New York uh, the next September. Want to go down further? This was the ad on September 7th. And then um, this was the ad on September 14th. You see the picture is different. Father Moon is in Korean Gar. And then September 27th, just a few days before the October 1st event. And now I'll go to my presentation. And also before I begin, I just want to, um, many of you have heard at the ACLC tours or in the ACLC pastor summits, uh, portions of this speech that we're going to be looking at tonight, Christianity in Crisis, given on October 1st in Carnegie Hall. Unlike many of his other speeches, this speech begins without uh, any kind of introduction. Usually, when Father Moon would give a speech back at this time, he would try to prepare the listeners that they might hear something new. They might hear something very challenging. And he would plead with them to please pray and prepare their hearts because as a prophet from the East, why would God send him all the way to America? if only to repeat what we already knew. What's unique about Christianity in Crisis is that actually the speech is Christianity in Crisis, new hope. Because when God sends a prophet, the prophet is not coming there just to merely condemn where people are or show us our sin. But God's hope is that we repent. God's hope is that we listen, we hearken to God's word, we respond to God's word, and therefore, we become, we go closer in our faith to God. And that is the hope of this whole speech. Again, tonight, you've heard in the introduction how ACLC's focus is on what can really revive this nation, and that is on the marriage blessing. In tonight's program, you won't hear it in these words. You'll hear it later on when we go further into this speech. Tonight's speech. Father Moon will be looking at Christianity's early history, its incredible sacrifice. He'll be looking at how it spread to Rome, how it spread throughout Europe, and finally through the Protestant Reformation, how it landed in England. And then he'll follow the course of the Puritans from the old world to the new world in this speech tonight. What's amazing is that a Korean man would come here and be speaking to, you know, learned 
Americans about the history of Christianity, about the history of this country. But I believe as you listen, you will see that God gave him a, an amazing perspective as one that he sent here to speak to Americans with the heart of Christ. Let us begin. Christianity in Crisis, Reverend Sun Young Moon, October 1st, 1973, Carnegie Hall. From Jesus Christ, a new world of salvation could be established. That is the history of Christianity. It went through the same course as Jesus. Whenever Christianity went to a strange country for the first time, the men and women who went with it had to undergo difficulties and shed their blood. Those who died undertook such suffering in order to be separated from the world and from Satan. They stood in the position where they could receive God's love and make themselves a sacrifice for others. If they had wanted to curse those who killed them, there could have been no providence for restoration. They had to pray for those who killed them. Without that kind of mind, Christianity couldn't proceed in the manner it did. Those things occurred because God had the intention to forgive Adam and Eve after they fell, if only an unfallen brother and sister would come out to console God's painful mind, think of the pain of their fallen brother and sister, and sacrifice themselves for the sake of the other. For some reason, I can't change it. I'm so sorry. I'm going to stop sharing. Just try to go back and... Stop sharing. I'm going to go back to my slide. I don't know why my slide is doing this. Maybe I've got to do that every time. I don't know. So sorry, y'all. We practiced before. I'll continue. All through human history, offerings have been sustaining the providence of God. In the Old Testament age, they made the offering of animals. But... In the New Testament age, Jesus was the place of the offering. Jesus was the substantial offering who labored hard in utter obedience to God and sacrificed himself. So in that situation, all humankind had to be united into one with Jesus. And by placing themselves in the position of Jesus, had to go through the offering. If in his career in God's providence, Jesus had succeeded in saving, saving all humankind, both spiritually and physically, then we could have been saved on both levels too. But he left salvation in the physical realm unaccomplished and accomplished salvation only in the spiritual realm. Since we are with him, it means we have realized salvation only in the spiritual realm. By the crucifixion, Jesus lost his base in the physical world, his physical body. So the purpose of Christianity is also to restore that lost physical body of Jesus. But Christianity cannot realize this goal without restoring the land, the people, and the sovereignty. Christians have to stand in the position where they can fulfill the providence of sacrifice on the levels of society, nation, and world. In other words, Christians have to resolve to offer themselves as sacrifices. After Jesus' crucifixion and glorious resurrection, the Christian church spread throughout Asia Minor. The principal thrust was toward Rome. Rome was the target because at that time, Rome was the world. For the world to be saved, Rome had to be conquered by the army of Jesus Christ. But this was an impossible battle, an inconceivable goal. The Roman Empire appeared as an impregnable fortress, not subject to conquest. Jesus' army was barehanded. They used no weapons, neither swords nor spears. 
They were armed only with their love of God and Jesus Christ. They marched fearlessly onward in conviction. They paid the price in blood and sacrifice. There can be no stronger army than the one which does not fear death. No enemy is invincible against an army of faith. History is witness to the deeds of that army of Jesus. The Roman Empire fell at last, and Jesus conquered Rome. Roman Catholicism became the center of God's dispensation for world salvation. The Pope was in the position to become God's champion. However, in the Middle Ages, corruption appeared in the church, and Christianity declined in spirit. Medieval church officials often were interested in their own power, their own authority, and their own welfare. The church enjoyed formidable power, both politically and economically. The hierarchy preserved this power, abused this power, and forgot about God's purpose. Church leaders clung tenaciously to their positions and ruthlessly persecuted their opponents. The hierarchy claimed lineage from Jesus' disciples, yet they could not rise above their own sins. The Christian spirit in many of, this, of these men was absolutely dead. But God had to continue forward. He is never satisfied with less than a total response. In medieval times, when there was much corruption in society, people like St. Francis denied everything and retreated from the world. Instead of pursuing worldly goals, he was loyal to a vision that he must revitalize the spirit of the church. He started a movement to enable Christians to give up those things which enslaved them and gave everything toward that goal. By overcoming worldly things, he could greatly advance and also lead everyone who understood his goal. However, even the Franciscan order became a dissent-ridden organization. The church needed more profound reform, so religious revolution came. Martin Luther sparked the Protestant Reformation, and significant reformers emerged within the Catholic ranks as well. Throughout Europe, righteous people determined to win liberation from the confinement of outmoded and abusive doctrines and practices. They wanted to worship God and Jesus, not the church as a worldly institution. The priesthood of all believers was the Protestant proclamation. Direct communication with God was their true desire. They helped God bring the world step by step closer to the ultimate goal. Later in England, many people objected to and resisted the autocratic, pra the autocratic practices of the state church. There was an outcry for extensive reform of the Church of England. The Puritan movement began, and it quickly spread, even amid persecution. These new seekers were a threat to the established church leaders, who used almost any means to suppress the new movement. Those who truly wanted freedom of worship soon had either to flee or to be imprisoned. Their spirit was strong, but they did not have enough power to resist the government at that time. They fled to Holland, and still they longed for some new world, some new heaven and new earth where they could find freedom to worship God. America must have seemed attractive to those who were dreaming of a new world. Even though America was unknown territory, it promised them the freedom of worship they craved. The pilgrims strongly desired to create a community of their own. America seemed an ideal place, so they made the courageous decision to venture there. 
they committed themselves to the treacherous journey across the Atlantic. They risked their very lives finding strength in their faith, which was stronger than their desire for life itself. Think of it. They had to give up their families, their relatives, their surroundings, and their country, and headed toward an unknown land. Their only hope was in God. Every step they took, they depended upon God. Their journey was long, and there were many storms. They prayed unceasingly to God. They had but one way to turn. They turned to God. When they were sick and dying on the voyage, they had no medicine to take, no doctor to care for them. They turned to God. Those pilgrim men and women were one with God, and that is how they survived. Put yourself in their position of total reliance on God. What a wonderful faith! I am sure that the faith of the pilgrims touched the heart of God. And when God is moved, he offers promises. And when he makes promises, he will fulfill them. God determined to give these faithful people the ultimate thing they wanted, freedom of worship. He then determined to give them even more. I am sure you know, as I have learned, that the Mayflower arrived at Plymouth Rock in New England almost in the dead of winter. November in New England is rather cold. The destiny of the newcomers could have been only starvation because there was so little food to eat. Given this fact, it really inspires me to learn about the store of grain in the hold of the Mayflower, which they would not touch, even though they were starving to death. They preserved this grain for planting the next spring. This was truly a supreme example of sacrifice. They preferred to die, hoping in tomorrow, rather than to act in desperation for only a few more days of life. The pilgrims came to this land full of purpose and hope. They knew that this purpose was of theirs was more important than preserving their own lives. Nothing could have given them this courage, this dedication, this sacrificial spirit, except their faith in God. When they arrived at Plymouth Rock, the 41 men who had survived the voyage got together and organized their ideas for government. The resulting Mayflower Compact was signed in the name of God. Amen. This really is really a wonderful story. This little group of people left Europe with their hope set in God. They grew sick and died in God. They survived in God. They formed their first government and signed their official papers in the name of God. The story of the pilgrims is a classic in God's history. It fits into the pattern of the righteous people of history, such as Abraham, Isaac, and Moses. These pilgrims were the Abrahams of modern history. They therefore had to brave many hardships even after the Mayflower Compact was signed. During the first winter in America, the population of the hardy Mayflower survivors was cut in half. Each day that winter brought a heartbreaking separation from loved ones. One by one, <clears throat> these courageous pioneers died. Yet their life from morning to night, from dusk to dawn, was centered upon the will of God. God was their only comfort, their only hope, and their only security. God was the principal partner for them, 
Here was an example of such a rare and pure group of God's people. They demonstrated untiring faith, and God gave them power and courage. They never lost their trust in God and their vision of the future. Their purpose in coming to America was to build a commonwealth centered on God, to establish the land where God could dwell, where they could really share fellowship with each other and rejoice in fellowship with God. This was all in God's providence because he needed a Christian nation to serve as his champion for the ultimate and permanent salvation of the world. So, another miracle came to the pilgrims. When they were just barely surviving and their population had been halved, the Native Americans could easily have wiped them out with one stroke. But again, God was a shield for them. The first group the Mayflower survivors encountered was not hostile. They, in fact, welcomed the settlers. How are we to interpret this? God intervened to save his people here in America. This is my belief. God wanted them to settle, and he gave the pilgrims a chance. As the population of the settlement grew, they ultimately pushed Native peoples away to enlarge their own colony. Of course, this land did not belong to the new American people originally. The land already possessed inhabitants, and the pilgrim settlers were, invader, were invaders from that point of view. Why then did God give these settlers their great chance? Here is my interpretation. God sided with the settlers because it was in his plan. In addition, these pilgrims met God's requirements and truly demonstrated an unwavering faith in God. God could not help but give them his promise and fulfill that promise. America's existence was according to God's providence. God needed to build one powerful Christian nation on earth for his future work. After all, America belonged to God first, and only after that to the people who lived here. This is the only interpretation that can justify at all the position of the pilgrim settlers. And it implies that if the American nation, which came from the pilgrims, does not fulfill God's hope, Great judgment will fall on behalf of the Native Americans. This continent was hidden away for a special purpose and was not discovered by European, European Christians until the appropriate hour. The people of God came at the appointed hour. They came to mold the new way of life. Their principal partner was God at home, in caring for their children, in farming or cooking or building, they let God share their work. He was the only security they had. A farmer might dedicate his family and his farm to God, sealed with prayer around the hearth and in the fields. Their everyday life was lived in the name of God. After the first spring visited them, they cleared the fields, planted, cultivated, and harvested the crop. And they attributed all their harvest to the grace of God. The beautiful tradition of thanksgiving thus originated. Following the next severe winter, the first thing they built was a church. The first road they built was the road to the church. At night, at dawn, in the morning, and at noontime, they prayed to God. I am sure they prayed, God, we want to build a place for you, which must be better than the old world. We want to build a place where you can dwell 
and be master. And they also had a vision that in the future, this Christian nation would do more, more good for the rest of the world than any other country upon the face of the earth. I am sure that after their church, they built a school. They wanted outstanding schools for their children, better than any schools existing in the old world. And their homes came last. After they built these homes, they dedicated them to God. This is the legacy of your ancestors. I know. I can visualize early America as a beautiful America because God was dwelling everywhere. In the school, in the church, in the kitchen, in the street, in any assembly or marketplace, God was dwelling. Thank you so much for your attention. That is just the first segment of this speech. Thank you all for your attention. Thank you, Reverend Hernandez, very much. And thank you for your diligence. Thank you for your commitment. Thank you for your research. Thank you for your heart in sharing the words tonight. We want to turn it this time for your questions that you may have. And you have the ACLC staff here with us. And I understand that we have a very, very, very important person to the whole movement of the leadership conferences and Dr. Kihun Kim. Dr. Kim is here with us, and let's see, as you post your questions, Dr. Kim being here, is there a word or a response that you would share, might share with us this evening? Dr. Kihun Kim. Uh, mucho gracias, uh, Reverend Hernandez. <laughs> gracias, gracias. <laughs> a great uh, history. And you know, Father Moon's uh, uh, teachings and how much uh, Father Mother Moon invested for the sake of Christianity. So I was very, very impressed. Uh, your introduction began uh, with uh, history. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Thank Wong. you, Dr. Kim. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, so. Minister Quinn, do we have questions here this way that we can raise today? Um, yes, it looks like um, Charles, Greg, Reverend Reland, you said, um, if someone has a different perspective, say from 1619 project and that racism is a foundation and focus of founding America, what would be your response? Uh, response yeah. would be that on, in, in terms of the Virginia colony, the history shows that the, the religious movement started then in the colonies actually in 1619 was with those from the Church of England. So it, it wasn't intended at that time to be about the race or the racism. But we do know that there was a pirate of sort on the waters that actually uh, stole the ship that was headed from Portugal towards Spain. And then that began the atrocity that turned out to lead to the chattel slavery that, that we did experience. But even at that time, it wasn't about a racial hatred. So we must have that in mind. So we wouldn't say that it started the racism in 1619, but we can say that the entrance of the diversity of people is 1619. On this East Coast, we must point that out, 
But uh, if we want to talk about, you know, in the entire United States of America, we'd have to go to the 16th century and talk about what was taking place with, from those who were Spanish in the, re, again, in religious arena in Florida, in San Diego. So there's a lot to it, but the history that Father Moon was bringing to us was the definite history from the Church of England that came into America, in Virginia, but also as was stated where it was purely announced about the pilgrim's journey. And as was well brought out tonight, the intentionality of coming to this land for religious reasons and Christianity. Reverend Hernandez, you want to add to that? Yes, I actually, in preparing for, is that my speaker doing that? Maybe I'll stop my picture. In preparing for tonight, of course, I was looking at 1619, and I was also looking at even the Africans who came here before 1619, the ones that came on Spanish ships to St. Augustine, and also the ones, the, the, uh, the, the enslavement and the of uh, Native Americans uh, in the Spanish colonies of uh, the New World. Um, I myself am about 13% Native American from tribes from uh, Mexico. Um, the, but as I was thinking about the, the whole picture of ultimately of slavery in the New World and how Father Moon, if, if he had been speaking about that, I'm sure he would have brought up the amazing uh, path of Joseph that is kind of reflected in uh, those African slaves who were able to uh, find their, their hope in the midst of darkness in, in Christ Jesus and in, in coming back to God and realizing that there had been people before them enslaved in great numbers uh, in Egypt. Um, that... Um, here he's talking about this kernel of Puritans, this, this, this group, you know, from which this nation could be blessed as a, a Christian nation whose intention is to save the world. The intention is not to, um, the intention would be also over time to purify this nation, to cleanse this nation of, the, of its sins because God wants a pure offering, a true offering. The reason that this, this, uh, this group drew God's attention is the drama of it as he tries to, that he's sharing from his heart, the drama that these, you know, these people that land here after losing some on the voyage, actually, as I was reading the speech the first time to, uh, earlier to yesterday, uh, I mean, I've read the speech so many times, but as I was preparing for tonight, I could actually imagine not only the pilgrims in the hold of their ship, as it crossed, a, you know, a, a, a tempest-filled Atlantic. But I was thinking about those slaves, which you said ended up in uh, on the Virginia coast in 1619, rather than their their original detention. But also all the other ones that came later on for the slave trade. Um, I was thinking about how both of them came here, and how. God works in a mysterious way to, in the first case, those pilgrims, those Puritans were willing to sacrifice themselves for the sake of coming for religious freedom. In the case of the slaves, they, they came not under their own, under their own desire, nothing of the sort, but they, in the midst of all of that, as they found out about Jesus, as they found out about uh, the love of God, they made a such an amazing, they, they are such a bedrock of our faith in America. And I really see it as a, as a, almost like a course of Joseph. Though he was betrayed by his brothers, he, he harbored no ill toward them, but uh, saw how God was somehow moving uh, through his enslavement, through his incarceration, through his maltreatment, that God was planning something bigger. And uh, 
I, I think also we look at the audience that he was speaking to uh, there that night at Carnegie Hall. And I think he was trying to, again, get across this point that um, America has a destiny right now. And if we don't deal with the, the, the crisis in Christianity, which is affecting America right now, then all of this comes to all of this comes to naught. I was also struck by the fact that he says that though these natives were dis displaced, the Native Americans were displaced, if America does not fulfill its responsibility, great judgment will come upon America on behalf of those Native Americans who suffered or, or were displaced. That's an amazing, an amazing statement. And I'm sure he would say the same thing uh, about any kind of injustice toward any people. Yeah, one of the things that's so touching to Marie and I, when we discuss Father and Mother Moon and look at the Christianity in crisis, is that how relevant it is to what is happening in our here and now and in our history that brought us here and now. Recently, I read a book that, you know, those of you who are interested in the, the 1619 is the 1619 project that's out now, a new origin uh, story. And in reading that book, I keep here among the books that I read, Father and Mother Moon and, and the others at my desk, it came to me that Father Moon's work with Christianity in crisis will bring the pathology that is currently resurfacing in terms of race, ethnicity, to a different view that probably would help with feelings that are among us right now. I just heard from yesterday, those that I graduated college with at South Carolina State, because we're right at the point of remembering the massacre in Orangeburg where South Carolina State existed. My grandparents lived at the time and in that first churches I pastored started there in Orangeburg. And so I had to acknowledge to them, I get the anger. Not all anger is bad and not all anger has to be destructive. But it will be destructive if we don't have the key ingredient factor, life, however you want to state it. And I'm going to give that to you from the perspective to make it relevant about what Father Moon says with Christianity in crisis. After I say this to you from a personal place, no one can know what the experience for Father and Mother Moon were like Dr. Kim can, having come from North America too. Nobody can know what comes out of your story if they haven't lived the experience of your story. It's hard for people to come and understand the story of those who see their ancestry or have a pathological disturbance because of 1619 and the experiences that we've had, even that from my own life with the Orangeburg massacre, for instance. But we all can share in this fact, and here's what Father Moon brings. God. And he's saying through Christianity and crisis, board of God, all of these things will lead to something that threatens this or that, that can lead to a destructive nature. And when Christianity is not moving to uphold and keep God. That's when the crisis sets in. We can be threatened by communism, 
Amen. We can be threatened by racism. We can be threatened by all of these other things. But when Christianity lives up to the, to the purpose for which God, as was read tonight, for which God moved, he sees this pilgrim establishment over in Massachusetts on down to Virginia, and then the great spread throughout this nation that God was in it to bring in a will that God only knew about with all of these things happening. And if we grab hold together of this faith, then all of us through our diverse experiences can have the hope of making it through. And ending the crisis of Christianity is gonna help all of us to make it through. In the way in which here today, we help to revive Christianity and give a new hope is through the blessing. I see, young son, I think we got time for one more before I call on Archbishop Lewis. Can we do a, another quick question and in, in answer? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Um, when somebody posted a question anonymously, um, it said, Father Moon is addressing the crisis of Christianity. From your perspective, Dr. Rouse, what is the great challenge or crisis to the Christian church or religious institutions in general in this modern era? Marie's in the background saying, oh, good question. <laughs> yeah, that person's very smart. <laughs> <laughs> and that is a great question because it gets to the core of what Father Moon actually Brings in Father Moon answers that question for us today. When the church, institutions of religion, or any other factor is on the borderline of being void of God. I even listen to speeches, preaching today with this in mind, especially it became even more as I came to know more and more about the teachings from Father Moon. Father Moon and Mother Moon teachings brings us back to the totality of the word, not just one portion of the word, but the Old Testament and the New Testament, and then they bring in also the whole language of God through the divine principle to put it in the perspective of God. When our church, when our institution, when any segment of society leans towards God being dead, and not dead in the literal sense there, but dead even to our consciousness, and we're threatened by socialism in its extreme, or communism in its absolute denial of God, that's when we're in the danger zone. But we can come through this when we come back to have God as the core of our existence. And we seek to be in obedience and restored to where we are to be with God. And that's why the holy marriage blessing that was given through true parents for us to bring our household, our workplaces, our institutions of learning, every aspect of our life centering on God, every part of our practical existence centering on God. That's the hope for America. That's the hope for the world. Thank you for wonderful questions. And ladies and gentlemen, this is just the start. Bring everybody next Monday as Reverend Hernandez continues us on this journey. But right now we're at the top of the hour and our one of our co-presidents of the American Clergy Leadership Conference, a member of the World Christian Leadership Conference Steering Committee is Arch 
Bishop Salant Lewis. Archbishop. Thank you, Dr. Rose. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Hernandez, for your work well done. And for Dr. Kim, I want to salute you this evening as well. And to each and everyone, the word of God said in Jeremiah 33 and verse 3, call unto me and I will answer thee and show thee thy great and mighty things which thou knowest not. And truly this evening, as I am about to close in prayer, the Christian in crisis will show us great things through uh, the leadership of Dr. Moon. And so this evening, I just wanna thank God for each and every one of you who ask questions and who want to get closer to this great worship that we're having on Mondays so that you can come on board and truly be blessed. Let me pray. Heavenly and eternal Father, merciful God, we thank you this evening for your infinite love and for your mercy that move us deeply into this studying this evening, listening to your word. Dear Lord, give us the desire to continue to spend time in your presence day by day. As we, your servant God, Hear these words this evening. We pray, God, that it may not go void, but it may fall on good soil. We thank you this evening, God, for the assurance of your love and for your presence with us this evening. Help us as we leave this line this evening to be doers of these words. God of mercy, teach us to believe and to trust in you. Help us to be an example of your faith. Oh God, this evening, we know God that somebody was looking out for us. We believe God that somebody remember us. So we thank you God for true father and true mother for your work that you have done through them. We thank you God for pulling us up out of the dark shadows. We thank you God Men and women are listening and dying every day, but when we hear these words, we pray, God, that your will be done with us. Oh, God, we ask you this evening to keep us under your keeping turn and your tender mercies. Thank you, God, for your anointing power this evening. Thank you for your love. We thank you for your peace and your understanding. Oh, glory to God, today is all we have before us tomorrow is gone and tomorrow not promise so father as they listen this evening to these words that father moon had left behind us this is what's happening today let us use this oh god to pave the way so others can be <coughs> flat footed for your name father we thank you may this day bring peace may this day bring comfort as we study together one more time, as we study together day by day, let your peace abide with us. Thank you and adieu. Adieu. Amen. Thank you so much. Amen. Thank you all. Minister Quinn. Thank you, Reverend Hernandez. Thank you, Archbishop Lewis. Thank you, YCLC. Thank you, Minister Holmes, for bringing on the dynamic man of God to pray for us tonight. And of course, we thank God for Dr. Kihun Kim. God be with you all. Thank you for your wonderful responses and questions tonight. And let us remember Father, Mother Moon, as we celebrate this week, their birth, especially over the weekend. And then let us come back again on Monday and talk about God being back with us for the future. Thank you. Have a great evening. Thank you, Hi, Dr. Be blessed. Thank, thank you, Dr. You. Kim. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Roth. God bless you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kim. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
Thank you. Thank you, Reverend Hernandez. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Rouse. Dr. Rouse. President. Thank you, Dr. Kim. Thank you, Dr. Thank you, Dr. Kim. Good evening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Thank you. Thank you for opening prayer. All right. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you, Thank you, Thank you, Thank you, Thank you, Thank you, Thank you. Yes. Thank yeah. you so much for your hard work. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Almighty, I will say to the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress. My God and Him will I hear you, my brother. I hear you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> okay, bye. Peace out, everyone. Bye, Bishop Lewis. Thank you so much. Love you too. Bye bye. Bye. Thank <laughs> you.